all. So glad that you are fellowshipping. I'm going to ask you if you will in the hallways, if you'll come in and find yourself a seat. It's good to see everyone out this morning. As you're making your way in to find a seat, uh, let me encourage you to turn off all your electronics, your phones and all that, so it won't be a distraction a little bit later. What a wonderful time that we have to gather and to look into God's Word, to praise God's name. I want to begin our service this morning reading from Psalm, Psalm 150. I want to draw your attention to these verses. Praise the Lord. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty heavens. Praise Him for His mighty deeds. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with trumpet sound. Praise Him with lute and harp. Praise Him with tambourines and dance. Praise Him with strings and pipe. Praise Him with sounding cymbals. Praise Him with loud, clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Stand with me as we praise the Lord this morning.
shines full at his command and all the stars Lord, what a joy it is for us to once again gather this morning to praise your name, for your name is to be praised. Thank you so much for all that you've accomplished for us. And Lord, in these next few moments as we reflect upon the redemption that you have provided for us by coming and dying on the cross for our sins, I pray, Lord, that we would put all distractions aside, that you will guide our hearts and our minds into the love that was demonstrated for us and for our sins. Thank you so much for that. I pray, Lord, that this would be a picture for those that don't know you of the great love that you have and the provision that you have in redeeming mankind from their sin. We pray, Lord, that you'd guide our hearts during this time. In your name I pray, amen. You may be seated. If you haven't gotten your elements, you can go back and get them. I invite you to do that now. A familiar hymn to many of us, nothing but the blood of Jesus, says, What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. You see, each of us as sinners needs the soul-cleansing, heart-washing that only Christ's sacrifice can accomplish. This morning we have the wonderful privilege to again turn our attention towards Christ's death on the cross and what it accomplished for the believers. I want to invite everyone who has personal, personally trusted Christ and entered into a relationship with Him to participate with us. If you haven't yet entered into a relationship with Christ or you're under church discipline, I would ask that you not participate, but that you would consider the power the cross has to change lives. Let's take a moment and allow God to examine our hearts as we prepare for communion.
I remember growing up and playing outside with my friends and all the games that we found ourselves playing would inevitably make my clothes filthy. At the end of the day, I'd come in and I would throw my stained and soiled jeans in the laundry. My mom would do the best that she could, but I would often get my pants back with some of the grass stains still left on them. Similar to those pants, sin has contaminated and stained every fiber of our being. We are reminded in Psalm 51 and verse 5, Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. In Psalm chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, we read, The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. You see, we were all born into this world as sinners. And we all continue to deal with sin because our fleshly hearts are bent towards sin and wickedness. The only way to remove the stain of sin and its power is through the cleansing that comes through the perfect spotless lamb of Jesus Christ. 1 John 1.7 tells us, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. You see, there's no amount of good deeds that could ever wash the sin of stain away. You and I are powerless to remove the filth of our sin. It's only the blood of Christ that is effective in completely removing the stain of sin. Christ's blood provides us complete cleansing. When we receive the gift of Christ's sacrificial offering on the cross for our sins, all of sin's stains are wiped away, past, present, and future. We're completely clean. This is great news. We're made completely clean. We're holy. We're acceptable to a holy, pure God. There's no more stain present. Christ's work on the cross cleanses us from all sin. It removes both the power of sin's influence in our lives and its penalty. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. I'm going to ask Travis Jacobs, one of our deacons, to thank God for the sacrifice of his son's body who's broken for us. Let's eat together. Not only was Christ's body broken for us, his blood was shed for our cleansing. I'm going to ask Steve Johnson if he will pray for the blood that was shed for our cleansing. Let's drink together.
going to invite you to stand as we continue worshiping this morning. What gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer? There is no more forever now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. And to this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. For my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing. All is mine, yet not I, but through Christ in me.
Speak, O Lord, as we come to you to receive the food of your holy word. Take your truth, plant it deep in us, shape and fashion us in your likeness, that the light of Christ might be seen today in our acts of love and our deeds of faith. Speak, O Lord, and fulfill in us all your purposes for your glory. Teach us. Let's, uh, let's pray. Great God in heaven, we recognize this morning that you're worthy of all praise and adoration, and we're so thankful that you've given us the privilege to stand before you through your blood and body broken for us. Thank you for the joy we've had in remembering our redemption provided by you for us and you alone. Lord, I pray that you would help us by this morning taking your word and planting it deep in us, that we would commit ourselves this morning to live your way, to walk your way, to do the thing you call us to and to be your kind of people. Pray that you would um, mature us, grow us in Christ likeness, and we do ask this all in your name, amen. All right, while, uh, while they're moving down, I just, uh, Janie, we're gonna actually start with the text, so if you wanna put that up, that'd be great. Um, it's kind of out of order a little bit, but I'm so glad dreams don't come true. I uh, dreamed last night <clears throat> that I prayed, and I looked up, and every one of you was sitting in a, a great big leather easy chair. <laughs> and I thought to myself, who approved that? <laughs> There's no way they'll stay awake. <laughs> But you're not in easy chairs. That's really good. It's really good. We're going to continue our, our uh, work through the book of Micah that the uh, associate pastors are doing. And I have today the section that is verses 10 through 16 of chapter 1. And uh, I think the best thing to do is just start off by reading it. So I'm going to have you stand and uh, I will read the text. You follow along either on the screen or on your tablet or whatever it is you have. Now's a good time to put Facebook away and get the Bible out. Um, 
I'm not looking at you, but I will. He says, tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. In Bethlehaphra, roll yourselves in the dust. Pass on your way, inhabitants of Shafir, in nakedness and shame. The inhabitants of Zanon do not come out. The lamentation of Beth Ezel shall, be take, shall take away from you its standing place. The, for the inhabitants of Marath wait anxiously for good because disaster has come down from the Lord to the gate of Jerusalem. Harness the steeds to the chariots, inhabitants of Lachish. It is the beginning of sin to the daughter of Zion, for in you were found the transgressions of Israel. Therefore, you shall give parting gifts to Morsheth Gath, to the houses of Exib, shall be, a deceitful, shall be a deceitful things to the kings of Israel. I will again bring a conqueror to you, inhabitants of Marsha. The glory of Israel shall come to Adullam. Make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. You can be seated. If there's ever a passage that needed no explanation, That's it. Let's pray. Now, I've titled this message, The Tale of Ten Cities. It was the best of times, and it was the worst of times. That could very easily be the description of the times of Micah. Because in both the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel, things were both very, very good and very, very bad at the same time. Economically, we know that during the reign of Jeroboam II in the north, the nation of Israel had expanded to its largest geographical size since the times of David and Solomon. And it was financial, experiencing financial prosperity that it had not really ever been known, it had not seen previously. In the south, during the reigns of Joram, Ahaz, and Ahaz, the kings of Judah had also experienced a great deal of political success and financial prosperity, but things were about to change. There were significant issues spiritually. Baal worship had been replaced or been mixed with the worship of Yahweh. The rich were getting richer and the poor were being broken by the corrupt authorities in the land. Justice was non-existent. The feasts of God had been stolen by the people to glory in themselves rather than to remember the goodness and provision of God. This becomes so bad that years earlier, Amos had proclaimed God's hatred of these feasts. In Amos 5, 21, God says, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Kind of like Christmas being about Santa Claus coming to town rather than the Son of God coming to earth. Black Friday becoming a day when we spend a lot of money rather than remembering the darkness that was on the face of the earth for three hours on a Friday afternoon. The Saturday between East Friday, Black Friday or Good Friday and Easter has become a day when we hunt for Easter eggs rather then remember the darkness and the hopelessness of his disciples while they were waiting for him as he lay in the grave. Easter has become more about Peter Cottontail rather than the Son of God coming back to life and out of the tomb. Rather than contemplating the goodness of God, We've replaced that, or they had replaced it with the glory of themselves. The glory of themselves replaced the glory of God, and he was not going to overlook it for long. As Micah is prophesying, Assyria is actually preparing to take, invade and take the nation of Israel captive and to take them away. And soon, he will begin to make moves on Judah as well. At this time, God's people needed to take seriously 
the righteous requirements of the law that are spelled out in the books of Moses. God was about to do exactly what he said he would do. Our theme for this book is the faithfulness of a fearsome God is the foundation for our hope. In the first section of the book, Michael covered a couple weeks ago, Micah has proclaimed loudly that both Samaria, the capital of Israel, and, and Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, have failed, and they're on the verge of facing destruction due to their failure. Israel had never really followed the Lord from her beginning and had worshipped idols even from when she was being taken until being taken into the captive by the Assyrians. Judah was also in jeopardy of being taken. And so this morning, our, shift, our focus shifts away from the capital city and to 10 little cities outside, 10 cities in the surrounding country. And what Micah does is Micah writes a, an incredible poem to, to call them to remembrance, to call them to think about the faithfulness of God, to call them to look toward the future acts of a faithful God and to cry out to them to respond to the faithfulness of their God. And so that's what we'll be looking at this morning as we, as we unpack our outline. And so our first point is this, there's a call to remember the past faithful acts of a fearsome God. As Micah begins his poem, just a second, <clears throat> As Mike begins this, I'd say, masterful poem, he, he begins, first of all, with a call to remember a fearsome deed, a fearsome act of a faithful God. Verse 10a says this, Tell it not in Gath, weep not in all. Now that is actually a direct quote of, of David. In 1 Samuel 1, verse 20, when David says this, Tell it not in Gath, publish it not in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised exult. This is what happened when David responded to the death of Saul. And it's a very poignant reminder to those who are reading this book, those who are hearing this prophecy, that they need to repent to escape the penalty for wrongdoing, to escape the judgment of a fearsome God. If anyone should have been successful, it should have been Saul. It should have been Saul. He was chosen by God to serve as the first king of Israel. He, he was head and shoulders taller than anyone around him. He was, he was a good-looking young man. He was successful. He was a successful son of his father. He was, in fact, a very kingly king. But he was not the success that he should have been. In examining what happened, we must look at his failure to consider the faithfulness of a fearsome God. Time after time, when Saul had the choice between right and wrong, he chose wrong. He, he chose to offer sacrifice himself, which was prohibited for the kings, instead of waiting for Samuel to show up. He spared Agag, the king of the Amalekites, Amalekites and some of, the, some of the stuff, some of the spoil from war. And when confronted with his failure, rather than responding in repentance for his wrong deeds, he responded by blame shifting and excuse making rather than confession repentance. As a result, God removed from Saul his spirit. God removed from Saul his kingship and he gave it to another. And eventually Saul died in battle and in a very inglorious way. He died in battle by taking his own life after being injured by a certainly fatal arrow. This was recorded for us in 1 Samuel 31, verses 3 and 4, says this, the battle pressed hard against Saul. And the archers found him, and he was badly wounded by the archers. Then Saul said to his armor bearer, draw your sword and thrust me through with it lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through and mistreat me. But his armor bearer would not, for he feared greatly. Therefore Saul took his own sword and fell upon it. 
How did a man with such promise beat such a disastrous end? I think it was his failure to take seriously the faithfulness of God, the faithfulness of God to his promises of both blessing and judgment. This allusion back to Saul at the beginning of the poem would cause the reader to have the proper attitude of fear and respect for the almighty God, just as God was faithful to his word in Saul's life, he would be faithful to his word in their lives as well. We would also do very well to listen that very same morning and take seriously the faithfulness of a fearsome God. This can be a great source of hope as we respond to his word correctly, but it can also be a great source of fear if we allow our desires to take the place of his. If we decide to seek our own ways rather than seek his way, if we decide to follow ourselves rather than follow him. With the reader, we are called to remember the past faithful act of a fearsome God. Tell it not in Gath, weep not at all. But he doesn't just stop with the past. He doesn't just stop with the past, talking about the past work, past act of a fearsome God. He now points them to look at the potential future acts of a faithful, future acts of a fearsome God. I'm going to get it right here in just a second, and you're going to be able to fill in those notes. I just, you are dying now. I know that. I know in your head you're saying, I can't even figure out what he's saying. I, I have it here in my notes. I know what it says. We are called to consider the, the future faithful acts of a fearsome God. Consider the future faithful acts of a fearsome God. That's the next call. Okay, I know I could get it. Verses 10b through 15 refer to 10 cities on the outskirts of Judah. Again, our focus shifts away from the capital cities and moves to outlying cities. These are not large cities by any stretch of the imagination. The, the, the largest one is probably Lachish, which is, which is one of the larger cities, one of the fortress cities. But most of them are just small rural communities that, that will be affected by the rejection of God in the capital city of Jerusalem. As he said, the, 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 where is the sin of Judah? It's, he said that in the first section, it's at Jerusalem. But we need to recognize, or they need to recognize, that the sin of Judah that is found in Jerusalem is not just going to affect Jerusalem, it's going to have an, out, it's going to have an effect in all of the country, in all of the outskirts, in all of these communities. And so, while the spotlight was been faced on, been placed on the capital cities, now it's going to move away to the out, outlying towns and the effect of these smaller towns, far removed, far removed from the everyday hustle and bustle of the big city life. While things were good for them now because of the success in Jerusalem, things would get very hard for them. Now, Micah is the master pun maker. He is really good at it. In fact, he is, he, I would call Micah and his writing style um, like the Hebrews of the Old Testament. Micah is so adept at the Hebrew language and making it, making it, drawing pictures with it, just like the author of Hebrews is in the New Testament. It's, a, it's an incredible book, and he's going to use these puns to drive, po drive home his point in these five and a half verses that he, he uses. Now, we use puns typically to get a laugh. When we're using puns, we're doing something to be, you know, punny. Um, uh, but that's not what he's doing. That's not what he's doing. He's using it differently. And, and I think it's a good time here to take a look and to, to talk about Hebrew poetry. Hebrew poetry. Just, we're just going to take a, a little sidestep here and kind of spend some time talking about Hebrew poetry because we need to understand that to understand what's going on. Hebrew poetry is not like our poetry. Hebrew poetry doesn't care about um, 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 meter and rhyme. It doesn't care about that. It doesn't care if it's iambic pentameter or, you know, whatever all those other things are that you learned in, in 
creative writing. I didn't learn it very well. Um, so uh, I'm not a creative writer at all. But it wasn't concerned necessarily with, with meter and rhyme. It didn't need to do that all the time. Uh, but it's more concerned with painting pictures. It's more concerned with, with uh, drawing parallels. Parallelism and, and chiasm is really what draws, uh, where Hebrew poetry draws its force and draws its strength. And Micah is going to use puns in his poem to drive the reader to recognize this is very serious and he needs to take it very seriously. And so what he does is he uses, he uses 10 cities um, of the outskirts to really, that really have a, 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 an opportunity for him to provide a play on words and to address all of the nation of Judah as he, as he opens up these puns. And so we're going to take just a, a, a brief look at all 10 cities and what he does. I know you just thought, Brian, taking a brief look at anything doesn't happen, but we're actually going to take a really brief look at it. He says, first of all, in Bethlehem, Aphra, roll yourselves in the dust. The, the word Aphra, the word Aphra at the end is, is almost exactly like the Hebrew word for dust. It's not exactly, but it's almost exactly like the Hebrew word for dust. One of the things I did um, in, my, in my four weeks of isolation a couple months ago was I began to teach myself the Hebrew alphabet. Um, not that I could learn Hebrew. I don't want to learn Hebrew. I could probably never do that, especially the way my brain works now. I could probably never learn the Hebrew alphabet. But I wanted to learn, or, or to speak Hebrew, I wanted to learn what Hebrew looked like. Um, because you, you get a Hebrew Bible out and you look at it, and all it is is a bunch of squiggles and jiggles and you know dots and stuff like that. And what I've learned is half of those dots mean nothing. It's like, why do you put dots in there that mean nothing? All that does is confuse me. But, but the neat thing about Hebrew is um, all the letters, all the letters always sound the same. To, you know, when you see this with a dot in it, that's this with a dot in it. And that's B, by the way. I just gave you B. So that's always, that's always that. It's always that. It always sounds that way. And what the neat thing about Hebrew is, whether you can speak it or not, you can actually see similarity just by looking at it if you know what the letters are. And what's neat is, you can take a Hebrew Bible and you can read this without even knowing Hebrew. You can actually say, oh, look, that's the same as that. Um, and that's, that's what I wanted to be able to do, was just to recognize things you don't see. Because you don't see, in reading in English, you do not see that Aphra means dust, right? You didn't see that. You didn't see that the word Aphra looks a lot like and sounds a lot like the Hebrew word for dust. So here's how you could read it if you understood what the Hebrew is. House of dust, roll yourself in dust. Um, that's what he's saying because Bethlehem means house of dust, roll yourself of dust. Bethlehem is house of bread. Get it? Beth is house. Okay, it's fun. I just got a Hebrew lesson for free. I'm not even going to charge you for that, although you may want to put a lecture in the offering plate. That'd be great. <laughs> Shouldn't do this on drugs. <laughs> so what is he saying? What is he saying? He's not saying to them, hey, go out and play in the dirt. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, go out and make mud pies and have fun out there. That's not what he's saying. No, whenever, whenever dust is considered in Israel, whenever dust is considered in Hebrew, it is a part of mourning. What did Job do when he was mourning for his kids? He sat in dust and ashes, right? When, he, when Hebrew people wanted to mourn, they threw dust on their heads. Throwing dust or rolling in dust is a sign of mourning. So why, M-O-U-R in mourning, like sadness, why would this city who is right now prosperous be called to roll themselves in dust? They would be called to do that because prosperity would soon be going away. If they did not respond to God correctly, their prosperity would be going away and they would be rolling themselves in dust, mourning what God was doing to them because of the loss that was going to face them. So house of dust, 
roll yourselves in dust because it's going to be that way. It's going to be sad. It's going to be awful. He says to the, the inhabitants of Shafir, pass on in nakedness and shame. Shafir uh, has the idea of beautiful. Beautiful. So to the inhabitants of beautiful, the inhabitants of beautiful walk around in nakedness and shame. What is he saying? He's saying your beauty is going to be taken away. Your beauty would be taken away. Rather than be beautiful, you would be disgraced and shameful. You would walk away in nakedness and shame. This is super reminiscent of what the Assyrians did when they conquered a city. When the Assyrians conquered a city, they, they did just exactly this. They would kill all the warriors. They would kill all the warriors and they would set them on pikes outside the city. Um, they would impale them on pikes outside the city as you walked up the road to the city. They'd be along the road so that people would say, oh, this city's been taken by the Assyrians. And then everybody else inside the city, old, young, women, children, all of that, those that couldn't fight, they would take them away. They would strip them of their clothing. They would put them in a line. They would put fish hooks in their lips. They would attach them to a rope and they would march them out of the city. They would be caused to pass by in nakedness and shame. You see, exactly what was going to potentially happen to them is what they're being called to recognize. They're being called to recognize that the judgment of God, the judgment of God was not going to be a pleasant thing. It was going to be despicable for them. And they need to remember, they need to remember that God is faithful to his word. He will keep his promise. He will keep his promise. That's what they needed to know. The inhabitants of Zanon should not come out. Another excellent pun. Zanon means exit. So those that live in exit would not exit. Those that lived in the city of exit would not exit. This brings to mind the practice of laying siege to a city. In Deuteronomy uh, 28, 52 to 57, there's a very direct reference to what God said he would do to the people if they failed to do what he said. Deuteronomy is a foundational book for all the Old Testament, especially for the prophets and for the minor prophets. Because what the minor prophets are doing, the minor prophets and major prophets are calling the people of Israel to remember exactly what God said he would do to them if they failed to obey him. If they failed to love him and fear him and keep his law and do it, then something would happen. And let me read to you what he says they will do. He says in Deuteronomy 28, 52 to 57, I don't have it all here, I don't think. In fact, I don't think I have it up on the thing. It says this, they shall besiege you in all your towns until your, all your fortified walls in which you trusted come down. He goes on in those verses to describe what would happen describe what a siege looked like and what would happen. And I won't, oh, go, I won't go and read all of those effects because they are not pleasant. They are not pleasant. They talk of what, what the, the, the most, most um, um, the nicest young man would end up doing. The princeliest prince would eat his children. The, 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 the most refined woman would, would do things that none of us would ever consider doing because of the difficulty that would be in place. Josephus tells us of later sieges that Israel faced and how difficult life was when supplies ran out and food was scarce. The picture of siege, the picture of the town of exits not coming out, being laid siege, should have been a solemn reminder of what God had promised to those who rejected him because he spelled it out specifically in Deuteronomy, which again is the foundation for all of this. He spelled it out specifically. And so he says to them, he says to them, you town of exits, you shall not come out. You will be shut up. You will be shut up inside. You see, why would this happen? because of their failure to follow God, 
their desire to follow after other gods, gods, and this is exactly what was happening in the nation at the time of Micah's writing, especially during the time of Jotham and Ahaz. That's exactly what is going on. Next, city number four. He says, the lamentation of Beth Ezel shall take away a standing place. That makes no sense until you understand that Beth Ezel means nearby city. The city that stands nearby will lose its standing place. So the nearby city would cease to exist. Guess what's happened to that nearby city? Of the 10 cities in the list, um, um, what are those people that do that kind of stuff? Archaeologists. Archaeologists know where nine of them are, or they're fairly sure where nine of them are. Guess which one they have no clue where it is. Beth Ezel, the nearby city. The city that stood nearby no longer stands. That's, to me, that's just, that's kind of stuff that ooh, freaks me out when I'm studying. It's just like, yes, God, you got it. You, you got this. But more than just freaks me out, it says to me that God is faithful. God is faithful to his word, and he was faithful back then. It was, if he was faithful in 730 B.C., what makes me think he won't be faithful now? When we got Facebook now, I'll stop. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's, that's, that's just, again, that's amazing to me that, that he, he is so faithful. And, and the town that was nearby doesn't exist. Your very place of home, your very place of security can and will be taken away by the faithful and fearsome God. Next city, number five, Marath. How are we doing time? We're doing okay. Wait anxiously for good because disaster has come down from the Lord. You, you should see something, M-A-R. You remember when Naomi um, suffers as much as she, she changed her name to what? What did she change her name to? You remember? Mara. What's that start with? M-A-R. M-A-R. You see, Maroth means bitterness. City of bitterness. And there's another, another beautiful play on words here because Micah tells the city of bitterness to wait anxiously for good. Wait anxiously for good because bitterness is coming. Bitterness is coming. Disaster is coming. You, you see, the implication here is that while they're waiting for good, they would not find it. They would find bitterness and disaster. But I like this because not only do they find bitterness and disaster, but... but Micah makes it clear where it's coming from, where it's coming from. You see, while it looks like the Assyrians, well, wait a second, I got to clear something up here for you. I know you're baffled by this, me too. I keep saying the Assyrians, but it, was, it wasn't it the Babylonians that took the southern nation captive? Wasn't it the Babylonians? Nebuchadnezzar, was he a Babylonian or was he an Assyrian? He was Babylonian. Keep waiting. I'll explain it in just a little bit. But it is the Assyrians. It is the Assyrians. Now I've got you on the edge of your seats. Even if they were easy chairs, you'd be listening right now. You'd be right there listening. You, you gotta get to the end of this one. So you'd be paying attention. So now you're paying attention. It is the Assyrians. I'm not making a mistake. It's the Assyrians that are coming against them. And it was the Assyrians who would bring disaster upon them. But they weren't the source. The source is the Lord. Read what he says. Read what he says because disaster has come down from the Lord. It's come down from the Lord. You see, while it is the Assyrians that are at, that are at play, it is the Lord who's bringing the judgment. Why? Because it is the Lord who is faithful to his word. And while he's faithful in the good, he's also faithful with the curse. And they needed to recognize that. So Micah over and over and over again is calling them, calling them to remember these things and giving them these word pictures to help them remember what he's saying. Number six, lechish. Lechish. I did learn that's how you say that. Lechish. I love that. Um, harness the steeds. Now, Lechish was a fortress city that was really somewhat famous for its chariots of war. And here the implication is that rather than harnessing the horses... To go into battle, <clears throat> they would be harnessing them to flee. 
Rather than getting their chariots ready to go into battle, they were getting their chariots to run away from battle. They were not good firemen. You know, firemen run into the battle. They were, like me, running away as quick as they could. No sense in getting burned. That's exactly what's going on in the beginning. Of the, the, so, so, so what is this beginning of sin thing? It was likely their reliance on their military strength. That's what happened in the north. The north said, the north said, uh, the, 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 the nation of, of Israel, when I say north, that's what I'm talking about. They said, look what we have done for ourselves. Look how powerful we are. Look how strong we are. We don't need help. We got this. We don't need God. We got this. We're good. We can do this. And so they relied on their own strength rather than relying on God. And that's exactly what was going on in Lachish. The beginning of sin was their reliance on their military strength rather than God. 2 Kings 18 actually records the capture and fall of this city, Lachish. It was in Hezekiah's reign that it happened. It was while Hezekiah would be making some reforms. We won't take the time to actually go there and read what happens, but it is, it is as he's begun to make reforms, as he's begun to tear down false worship that his father and grandfather did, there was, there was this reminder that God still is faithful to keep his word, and Lachish falls to Sennacherib, the king of Assyria. In fact... Sennacherib was so proud of this defeat of Lachish that he actually drew, had, had great reliefs painted in his palace. And those reliefs still exist. They're in the British, British Museum today where Sennacherib tells the story in pictures of his conquering of the city of Lachish. What's interesting is there's no, there's no pictures of him taking Jerusalem but he was on his way toward Jerusalem. Why didn't he take Jerusalem? Because the people of Israel took seriously the promises of God and they repented. We'll talk about that, we'll talk about that. So, so um, what did I say? I can't think of the word. Um, get the steeds ready to go. Hook up the chariots, I can't even think what I'm saying. Harness is the word, it's right here in my notes. Harness the steeds. Harness the steeds. That's part of my head right now. You have to get used to that. That's just the way I live. Um, harness the steeds to run away, not to run toward. Number seven, Morsheth Gath. Happened to be Micah's hometown. Happened to be Micah's hometown. And the name is closely related to the Hebrew word for dowry. So the idea here is, um, he says this, he says, um, therefore you shall give parting gifts to Morsheth Gath. That actually parting gifts should be translated dowry. Give a dowry to the dowry. Why? Because she's, she's going away in marriage, but not to a nice husband. Not to a husband that would love her. Going away to a husband that would treat her harshly would be a cruel husband. She would be taken and sold to a cruel husband who would not treat her kindly. That's Morsheth Gath. We'll keep moving. The house of Aksib would be a deceitful thing for the kings of Israel. You have to look a little harder to see, the, but the name of the town looks very much for the word like a dried up stream, a dried up stream. So he says, when the kings of Israel would come to find refreshment at this place, when they go uh, to find uh, refuge, <clears throat> rather than find refuge, they would find only a dried up brook. They would find no help at all. They'd find no help at all. Number nine, Marisha. Marisha is related to the Hebrew word for possess or possessor. And there's a play on her words here that says that the possessor would be possessed by another. The city would not remain free. The city would not remain standing on its own, but it would be rule of, and reign of another despotic king. Again, a call to remember the faithfulness of a fearsome God. We're moving quickly now. Finally, we reach Adullam. Adullam is a, 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 a place that uh, a lot of us have been. If you've been to Israel, when we go to En Gedi, you've seen the caves of Adullam. It's where David went to hide from Saul when he was being pursued. And what's being said here is once again, rather than the kings of Judah, rather than the kings living in their palaces, they would be fleeing to the caves to stay away from their pursuers. They would go 
and, and run away. And, and instead of glorious reigning in their palaces, and, and, and trust me, the houses they built for themselves were amazingly beautiful. But rather than stay there in those homes, they would run for the caves because eventually, as the outlying cities fell, even Jerusalem would fall. You see, there could be no escape, no escape from the fear, faithful hand of a fearsome God. No escape. In this powerful, powerful poem, the reader is called to consider the future faithful acts of a fearsome God. This consideration should be a serious look at the power and plan of God. I'm also reminded that while we're confronted in a word with what largely happened to capital cities of Jerusalem and Samaria, when we read these histories, we see what really happens to those capitals. We need to remember that all the outlying cities fell as well. All the outlying cities fell as well. And, and it's, in, it's important that we recognize that, that what happens in leadership, we'll talk about this in a little bit, what happens in leadership affects everybody, affects everybody. But wait a second. I thought that the theme for the book was this, the faithfulness of a fearsome God is the foundation of our hope. Where is the hope? I haven't read it yet. All I've read is disaster upon disaster upon disaster. Where is the hope? It's here. It's here. And that is the last call to the reader that Mike issues, and it is a cry to respond to the present faithfulness, faithful correction of a fearsome God. See, in verse 16, the focus shifts back to Jerusalem. And it's a cry to the leaders of Jerusalem to respond to the faithful correction of a fearsome God. He calls those reading to make themselves bald. What is, what does he say? He says, make yourselves bald and cut off your hair for the children of your delight. Make yourselves as bald as the eagle, for they shall go from you into exile. I'm sorry, that's bothering you. It bothers me too. I wish it didn't happen. But that's what God wants for me right now, so let's praise him for it. And I mean that, absolutely. So what is this? What is this? You see, the high priest, the priests of Israel would never supposed to shave themselves. They were never supposed to mourn. If you recall back to the first high priest, his name was Aaron, um, he, had, he had some sons. He had four sons. His two oldest sons, his two oldest sons on the very day, it looks like anyway, as you read it, on the very day that he was ordained as high priest, that he was, that he was inaugurated or what's that word? that you put stuff on their head, anointed as high priest. Thank you, John. You didn't realize you did that for me, but just looking at you did because of the beard. Anointed high priest. The very day he was anointed high priest, his two sons offered some kind of strange fire, and they died. They died. And, 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 and as, as, as they die, Aaron just fails to have dinner. He just fails to have dinner, and God is going to kill him. Because he fails to have dinner, and Aaron says, what? My sons died. My sons died. I'm not hungry. I'm mourning my sons. And God says, okay, I got that. I got that. I won't kill you then. I won't kill you. That's how seriously God took the, the responsibility of a priest, a high priest, not to mourn, not to ever show any kind of mourning, because Why? What is wrong with that, God? Because they were to recognize that everything God did is good all the time. And it's all a part of his plan. And it's all about him being faithful to his word. And they were the representative. They were the representative between God and man. And they were never to show displeasure with God. What's interesting here is they are being called to shave their heads bald and mourn. 
They're being called to do that because that's how awful this is. That's how bad this is. That's how disastrous this is that God is going to do to these people. And they need to respond in such a way that shows all the nation, we can't keep this up. We've got to repent. We've got to stop. We have to live the way God wants us to live. And there is good news. There is hope. There is great hope. Because we read 2 Kings 18. And we read about a king named Hezekiah. The grandson of Jotha, the son of Ahaz. And we read that he was, he was not like them. We read this about Hezekiah in 2 Kings 18. He did what was right in the eyes of the Lord. According to all that David his father had done, he tore down the high places, broke the pillars, broke the bronze serpent that Moses had erected in the wilderness into pieces. Now the serpent had apparently become, become a, an object of worship itself rather than the God of the serpent. And so Hezekiah said, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. And he broke that serpent even into pieces. That serpent, that, that's the exact serpent that Moses had lifted up in the wilderness. It got broken to pieces under Hezekiah because he didn't want any remnants of idol worship. Hezekiah got it. Hezekiah took seriously the promise of God to be faithful to his word. And guess what happened? Sennacherib could not take Jerusalem. And Sennacherib did not take Jerusalem because Sennacherib was a failure. Sennacherib, I said it completely backwards now. Sennacherib didn't take Jerusalem because God stopped him. God stopped him. Because the people of Israel responded correctly. God was faithful to keep his word. And he restored them. And this is in 720 BC, God restores. And it's not for another 140 years that Israel is taken captive, that Judah is taken captive. These reforms lasted for a while. You see, there's good news. There's good news that the Lord was with him, it says, wherever he went out. Because he was a real special guy? No, because he took seriously the word of God. Took seriously the word of God and the calls that was, were being made by the prophets of his day. He responded correctly. You see, responding correctly to the word led to revival and reformation in the land of Judah. You know, I wonder if, if that could happen in the land of Judah that was so far off. Do you think it can happen here? Do you think it can happen here? I, I think that, that we've given up at some, stre some point. I think we folded our hands in resignation that, that, well, I guess God's done. But what, what if, what if we were to be the church of God? What if we were to act like people who took the word of God seriously? What if we were to take seriously our commission to take the good news of the gospel to the world and fight the real battle? What do you think might happen? Hezekiah, Hezekiah, because he responded correctly to the word, saw reform, saw reform. I, I think we could. Now, based on this poem, in the last few minutes that I have, I'd like to draw five implications for us. That's the numbers one through five on your page. First is this, we need to recognize we need to recognize, everyone in this room needs to recognize that God is faithful to his word and he is fearsome. He is to be taken seriously. He is to be taken seriously. And if you've never responded to him in faith, you need to know this, that he has revealed himself to us as the creator of the entire universe and as the creator of the entire universe, he is the rightful ruler of that universe. He has revealed that while he created Man initially sinless and placed man and woman in the perfect environment <clears throat> of the Garden of Eden. Man failed when tested. Man failed when tested. And 
rather chose than to be obedient to his creator, man chose to serve himself. This brought sin into the world. This brought sin into the world, and sin passed on all. And because of Adam's sin, every one of us in this room will die, and every one of us in this room has been dead spiritually. This is something that has to be taken seriously. Has to be taken seriously. You can do nothing, we can do nothing in and of ourselves to gain his favor back or in his forgiveness. This is something to be taken seriously. Only God can do this. Just like we talked, what a perfect communion for this point. Only God can change it. Only his son did it. And if you are not a follower of Christ, you need to listen very carefully and respond to his call to repent and believe, and you need to respond right now where you are without delay, without delay. Because you see, he sent his son to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, to die a terrible death to be in the grave for three days and to rise from the dead like no one else has ever done, to rise and sit at the right hand of the Father. And he said, because of that, I call you to repent and believe. If you've never done that, this is the day of your salvation. This is the moment. Respond. Take him seriously. Take his word for what it says. Do not neglect, do not reject, do not think somehow it won't affect you. There'll be a day, there'll be a day when God comes and God judges and you can't stand on your own righteousness. You need his. Please, please do not leave without responding to his call. You can talk to people around you if you need more clarification. But I think number two, the implication is what we do today, the things we do today have ramifications for tomorrow. Have ramifications for tomorrow, duh. But I think sometimes we don't think about that. Sometimes we think I can live for today and today will be its own and nothing matters. That's not true. The things we do today matter for tomorrow. How senior, it's highlighted in the fact that how Samaria and Jerusalem were responding to truth was affecting all the outlying areas. It's true on a national level. I think it's also true on an individual level. The choices we make have an effect, definitely have an effect on our future and the future of those around us. That calls us to be aware of the choices we're making and to take seriously what we're supposed to do. Number three. Number three, this one is for uh, leaders specifically. Leadership affects more than just the leader. I was confronted this as I read the accounts of the kings associated with, Mike, associated with Micah's prophecy. When there was a godly king, Israel responded well. Conversely, when there was not a godly king, the people were not godly. And this this invited the judgment of God on everyone. How the leader led invited either the blessing or judgment of God on the entire nation. Leadership is important. We as leaders must be careful to live according to the truths and principles found in the word of God. And as we do, the, do so, this affects those under our leadership. And before you breathe thinking, ha, I don't need to write that one down. Let me suggest that every one of us is a leader in our homes in some capacity, or everyone is a leader in some capacity, whether it's in home or not. If you're a father or a husband, you're a leader in your home. Parents, you are leaders of your children. Employees, you are leader, employers, you are leaders of your employees. Employees, you can be leaders of those with whom you work. Children, you're leaders in your classroom. You're leaders of your brothers and sisters. You're examples to your siblings. People on sports teams, you should be leaders on your teams. How are you leading? How are you leading? It will affect those around you. Looking back to the feasts, I would call, ask us as fathers, how are we leading when it comes to feasts? 
Are your feasts about God? Are your feasts about you? Sometimes leadership has to make hard decisions. I would call us as leaders to make those hard decisions and to live according to the word of God. Number four, change starts here and change starts now. Change doesn't happen. Change does not happen in Washington, D.C. It doesn't. Change happens in our hearts right here. That's where change starts. I think, I think we're, we're waiting. We're waiting for a, a president or a Congress or whatever to initiate change. That'll never happen. That'll never happen. If you understand how Washington works, that will never happen. All they want to do is get reelected. It's all they want to do. They don't care about you. There is someone who cares about you immensely. And his name is Yahweh. And his name is Jesus. And his name is the Holy Spirit. And real change will affect, will start here. That's where real change will start. That's how it'll happen as we take seriously the word of God. Change starts here, right here, right now. And this is true politically, relationally, and spiritually. Let God change you today. Number five, I'd say this. Don't give up. Don't give up. I think oftentimes we give up. But if you read the account, Micah began to prophesy in Jotham's reign. There was Jotham, then there was Ahaz who reigned for 16 years, and then there was at least four years where Hezekiah reigned before the reforms were implemented. So if you do the math, if, if he, let's just say he started reigning halfway through Jotham. That's eight. Eight plus 16 is 24, plus four is 28. 28 years, 28 years Micah prophesied. Micah says he was going to walk around naked. Not a prayer, and I don't, I don't want to go there. That's what he says. He's going, to, he's going to be mourning. Micah did that for 28 years before reform happened. But he didn't give up. Think about 28 years. 28 years ago, when you talked about texting, you were carrying a book. 28 years ago, if you said the word Google, people thought you were doing baby talk. 28 years ago, Amazon was a river in South America. 28 years ago, Patrick Holmes hadn't even been conceived. 28 years is a long time to wait. But Micah kept on and kept on and kept on, and kept on, and guess what? God was faithful to his word and answered Micah's prayer and brought reform to Micah's nation. You know, maybe you're praying for a relative. Maybe you're praying for a nation. Maybe you're praying for a husband. Maybe you're praying for a wayward child. Maybe you're, you're, you're doing everything you can in that wayward child, and I know it gets old. Maybe, maybe you're sick and you're waiting to get well. Maybe, I don't, I don't know what it is, but let me encourage you with this. Don't give up. Don't give up. God is faithful to his word. And I would encourage you with this, the faithfulness of a fearsome God is the foundation for a hope. Don't leave without knowing that for sure. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for this great truth found in your word. Help us to take it seriously. Help us to leave here knowing that you're good, that you're God, that you're faithful, and that you will accomplish your perfect purpose in everything you do. Make us like you today. We ask this in your name. Amen. Go ahead and, and stand.
Um, I close. Oh, go ahead, sit down. Go ahead and sit down. I got another message to preach. No, I don't really. <laughs> no, I did. I did, however, make you a promise. And I, I don't want you to uh, put that extra back in your pocket. I want it to go, go ahead in the offering plate. I made you a promise. I'd explain uh, Assyria and Babylon. In, in Micah's day, Assyria was the world power. It was the world power. But God, because I think largely because of the repentance of Hezekiah, Assyria is taken out of the way by Babylon. And they, they then become the world power. So in 140 years, God can take world powers and change them completely. That was supposed to come under the part where it was the Lord who did that. So that, you get that one extra. So I'd um, um, like, to, like to invite you to come back. Tonight is the picnic. Um, it's going to be a fun day, going to be a fun evening. Hopefully I can make it. Um, please be back at 445 is when the picnic starts. Um, of course, uh, worship continues um, throughout the week as we pray for each other, as we, as we, um, as we uh, interact with each other, as we give. Uh, again, the way we do that is either through the little boxes in the back, online, or you can bring it to the office. Either way, those is great uh, opportunity for worship. So go ahead now, you can go ahead and stand. Um, and Otto will close this out because I got nothing at this point.